Okay, so we're at 10.50, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm going to be giving this talk on localization and translation um, and internationalization in your Rails apps. Um, cleverly entitled Finding Translations, although someone yesterday uh, suggested the alternate title of Many, Many YAML Files, um, which we'll get into why that might be a fitting title for this talk as well. Um, but we'll start out just by defining our terms. So localization is the process of adapting internationalized software sp for a specific region or language by adding the locale-specific components and actually translating the text. Internationalization refers to the process of actually um, setting up your app in such a way that it can be translated. Um, and we'll be talking mostly about how to set yourself up for success in terms of um, when you are designing your app, um, even if maybe you're not even planning on having it translated off of the bat, uh, some of these pro uh, processes and things will be good things to have in mind um, in any case. So thanks, Wikipedia, for those definitions. Let's get rolling. Um, in plain English, we're talking about translating and, more importantly, getting ready to translate your app. Um, so what are we talking about when we talk about translation? There's the most straightforward type, um, which most people are going to be thinking about when I say the word translation, which is English to French, French to Arabic, English to German, Swahili to Esperanto, Spanish to Cantonese, etc. cetera. Um, other things that are important in this translation process, though, is what country you're actually talking to. Um, so are you talking to British consumers? Are you talking to American consumers? Um, are you talking to Portuguese consumers? Are you talking to Brazilian consumers? Those populations are going to speak the same language but are not necessarily going to have the same um, content be, de be delivered to them. Um, another thing you want to be aware of is the register, um, whether that's formal or informal, um, professional or like your Twitter feed, um, AP style or MLA style, I guess, uh, things like formatting, so on and so forth. We're mostly going to be talking about the first type, um, but you should always have in mind the second type. When you're doing a translation, you should be thinking about what country the people using that language um, are going to be coming from. Um, things that will be relevant to that are things like units of measurement, government legal terms, uh, date formatting, so on and so forth. And the third type is not something we're going to talk about really, um, but your translators should be aware of where you're coming from in terms of the register that you want to convey in your app um, so that they can write to the same uh, kind of audience. I could also see using these same tools to uh, transpose between registers. So say you had a kids and parents version of your site, um, you could use some of these I18N um, conventions to, to do that as well. I've never done it, but it could be fun. Um, so who am I? Uh, points if you get this joke, uh, 24601. Um, I'm Valerie Willard. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Valerie Codes, and you should tweet this talk because at mentions are my lifeblood. Um, I'm a Rails developer at Panoply, which is a podcasting platform. We're part, yes, podcasts. Um, we're part of uh, Slate. Um, and if you want to geek out about podcasts, please find me after the talk and I will give you all my recommendations and take all of your recommendations and my subscription list will continue to balloon uh, uncontrollably. Um, I have interests in linguistics, translation, and language studies. So prior to becoming a developer, um, I was a French major. Um, I studied cognitive science with an emphasis in linguistics. Um, so I've done a bit of translating in an academic uh, setting um, and was hoping I could maybe add some insight to 
folks who are maybe not as familiar with the translation process um, who are getting ready to, to translate things. So without any further ado, so you want to localize your app. Um, you might feel like this dog, especially if you're not familiar with a lot of the pitfalls that can come along in, in this process. So when should you think about localization? Um, you should think about it now. Um, even if you don't actually foresee a future in which you want to have localized versions of your app, um, if you think about your po possible audience, it is probably not just US-based English speakers. Um, if you think about just the number of languages that are spoken just in the United States, um, if you're limiting yourself only to English speakers, you are really, um, really limiting yourself. Um, so it's something that should be on your radar as a possible thing that might come down the line. And even if you never localize it, you won't be hurt by using some of these conventions um, and they can give you other wins in your development process. So when should you think, when should you internationalize? Um, so you want to be thinking about this, again, before you need to. Um, for, for example, um, don't hard code strings into your views. Um, this is a very easy win. Um, you can use locale keys in your views, um, have those reference a YAML file, and that way you can have all of the copy for your app. Uh, separated out from the actual code. So say if you have someone who's not a developer who wants to make changes to copy, you don't have to have them dig through the code and, and make those changes. You can have them edit a YAML file, which is probably going to be much easier for everyone involved. So there are lots of built-in tools for Rails localization. Um, there's this i18n guide, which goes over uh, the basics of how to use those tools, um, how to create keys that you then reference in your app. Um, the default setup for Rails localization is to have a YAML file, as I've alluded to a couple times, um, where you will have a key and a string. And when you reference that key, uh, in, your, in your application, that string will be pulled from the YAML file. Um, and then you'll have YAML files for each locale, so you'll have a French one and an English one and so forth. Um, and based on the locale setting on your app, the correct string will get pulled in. Um, and there's a lot of things built in for you. There's also um, a localize so there's i18n.t, which is translate, that refers more to the pulling the correct strings. Um, and there's also um, localize, which refers more to, as I was mentioning, the units of measurement, um, things like that. That'll be related to where the, the person is from. OK, so you've got some YAML files with some strings in them. Um, this can get annoying really fast, especially if you have, say, maybe hundreds of strings or thousands of strings or tens of thousands of strings uh, in your app. Um, depending on how complex your app is, these files can get really unmanageable. Um, so you should be thinking about um, whether this is something that is practical for you and for your app and your organization. Um, one way you can maybe make it a little easier on yourself is to customize these YAML files to be per feature um, or something like that so that you don't have one single YAML file that's storing every single string that you use. Um, but at the same time, this, this is still like not something that you probably want to use for a super, super complex app. Um, here are some helpful gems in your localization journey. Uh, one of them is Rails I18n. This provides tons of translations in different languages, different locales, 
for the errors um, that are kind of baked into Rails, um, active record things, uh, default date formatting, things like that, so that you don't have to waste your time doing those things. Um, so that is super helpful to kind of get your localization stuff off the ground. A uh, locale app is a gem and provides a web interface for storing translations that translators can log into. Um, it's a paid service. I'm not sure if there's a free tier, but something worth looking into um, if you're looking to add translations. Um, and it's also tied to paid translation services, so you can pay someone from there to actually go in and translate all your strings for you. Uh, Globalize is a tool you're gonna wanna use if you're adding translations to your active record models. Um, so if you wanna, say, localize attributes on a model, uh, say you have a blog and your posts are stored as active record models and you want to have alternate versions of your blog posts in different languages, this would be the tool that you wanna use for that. Um, through Geocoder, you can, um, the Geocoder gem, which also does a lot of other things, um, but one tool that it'll provide you is being able to set a locale based on a user's IP address. So that's also super helpful. Um, I18N Tasks is a gem that will go through and report keys in your YAML files that are missing or unused. Um, it'll remove unused keys optionally, and it can also pre-fill mis missing keys from Google Translate if you wanna play it fast and loose. Um, one possible workaround for this YAML nightmare that we've described um, is proposed in this Railscast episode um, that you can look into. It provides a sort of framework for a Redis-based backend for the uh, locale keys. Um, another possibility would be to do like an active record or another database-based backend. Um, the things that you'll wanna keep in mind though are that these keys are gonna, there's probably gonna be tens, dozens of them loaded on every page. Uh, so they'll be, need to be accessed all of the time. Um, and so an in-memory store um, or some sort of cache is probably gonna be preferable um, to having to do a database lookup um, at every, every time a key is referenced. Um, if you decide to just stick with the YAML, um, you can edit it the usual way, maybe in a graphical YAML editor. Uh, one thing that you might wanna keep in mind when you're thinking about how exactly you want this translation backend to work is that the people who are doing your translations who are gonna be entering these keys are not necessarily gonna be developers. Um, so if you've got people from the marketing department, if you've got professional translators, uh, you probably don't want to tell them to like boot up Sublime Text and write some keys in. Um, you probably want to provide some sort of GUI or graphical interface for them to make their lives a little bit easier. So these are the things um, that I feel like are most important to consider when you're talking about how you're going to localize something. Uh, first, you need to know what needs to be translated, kind of the scope of is this a... 10,000 line project, is this a 100 line project? Um, do we need to hire a professional translator um, do, because we need really polished translations or will a Google, Google Translate uh, situation be adequate to our needs? Uh, do we need to translate the attributes of a model? Uh, what are maybe the length of the strings that we wanna translate um, related to like how readable Maybe they'll be in like a YAML interface. Um, are there special characters that you'll need to think about whether your uh, database or data store of choice supports? Um, and what information in addition to just those strings is it helpful to provide to your translators? So what tools do they need to give you a really good translation? Maybe some contextual information uh, maybe a nice GUI, 
so that they don't have to edit things in Sublime Text and push them to GitHub is maybe the, the best solution there. So this is something that I've come across in, <laughs> in um, looking over apps that people have tried to localize. Um, anytime you are concatenating, say, locale keys together to form a single sentence, that's probably a point at which you need to look at your life and look at your choices and find out a way not to do that. Um, the reason for that being the first in my parade of foolish assumptions, and that is that fragments can be translated with any accuracy. Um, the reason for that is probably clear to you if you've studied a foreign language, but um, syntaxes are different in different languages. Um, the subject verb object ordering may be completely different. Um, the verb may go at the end of the sentence. Um, the context of the full sentence may be needed for conjugation or for gendering of nouns, things like that. Um, instead, what you'll want to do is use, so there's an example here of a variable um, in a full sentence. Um, if you need to like pass in the name of a column where you have an error or something like that, or a proper noun. Um, so the IATN in Rails will support this passing of variables. So you can just pass in a key and a variable, and the variable will get dropped into that key like so. So here has the errors variable. Um, and that way you can provide your translator with the full sentence and context in addition to the variable that'll just be replaced. Another pitfall is assuming that pluralization works the same in other languages. Uh, I included a link to this um, very thorough um, sort of survey of pluralization rules in tons of different languages. But the gist of it is that in English, we generally have the same pluralization for zero and more than one thing, so kind of the same grammatical structure, and then a separate pluralization rule if there's one thing. Um, other languages do not necessarily do this in the same way. They make, may make different distinctions where zero things follows one rule, one thing follows another rule, more than one thing follows a third rule. Um, so don't hard code these th strings. Instead, uh, IATN provides you with a very useful count variable where you can just um, define these different keys for one, other, and zero. Um, and pass an integer in as a count. Um, and based on the value of that int integer, the one, other, or zero key will be dropped into your view. Um, another thing to be aware of when you're translating is that other languages are not necessarily going to use the same level of specificity. Um, you, you, may be able, you may need to provide more information to your translator than an English string will provide. Um, so things to be aware of here are like gender. We talked about um, register. They'll need to know whether you're hoping to address your users in a more formal or informal uh, register. Um, also, the words, they're just maybe more specific words in the other language that they'll need to be aware of what exactly you're talking about. Um, so, for example, in Korean, there are multiple words for the English word in, one to denote a snug fit in a container, one to denote a loose fit. Um, so these are just um, things that you should know, um, things that your translator uh, might need to, need to be aware of. Another thing to know is that a message cannot necessarily be conveyed in another language in the same physical space as it can in English. Um, they're in languages that use um, other character sets. Um, the messages may be much shorter. Um, you may have something that takes one line in English and two lines in French. A general rule um, that I followed when I was translating French was that 
it always seems to take more words and more characters to say the same thing in French that it does in English. Um, for that reason, you'll need to think about what you want to do if you need to fit more characters in a space um, or if something will look weird if you have a much shorter string than the Eng English one. Um, do you want to shrink the text down in certain situations? Um, you probably want to avoid fixed height or width containers unless you're going to test um, whether that string fits in the fixed height or width container in every language that you support. Um, so this is something to be aware of when writing CSS and doing more of the front end work. Another scary thing, um, the text may not always be left to right. Um, so there are a lot of design implications here. Um, Oops, sorry. Um, so this is screenshots from the BBC's website, one from their Arabic website and one from their um, North African French website. Um, so you'll notice it's not just the text that's flipped, it's also the like logo and some of the design elements, uh, the search bar is on the other side um, because the idea is that like the eye will gravitate toward the right side rather than the left. So there are a lot of other design implications beyond just, you know, flipping, flipping the alignment of the text in the container. Your character set will not always be the Roman alphabet necessarily. Um, so you should make sure that um, other characters are, other character sets are supported if you're planning to support um, non-Roman alphabet languages. Okay, so you've got all this. You have all of these pitfalls in mind. You've got these wonderful YAML files that are filled with wonderful translations that people are making updates to all of the time. And you have merge conflicts constantly um, because everything's in a YAML file and everyone is editing it and it's terrible. Um, you're very likely to get merge conflicts, um, especially if everything is in one place. Um, and because the people doing your translating, adding your copy are not necessarily developers, you probably don't want everyone who makes copy to have access to, say, your code repo. Um, so th some things to do here can break up keys um, based on functionality based on features. Um, you can add your YAML files to make it make them a submodule of your main repo so that you can give people access to just the YAML files rather than giving them access to the whole repo. You can have a database store that people edit from that is then pulled into a YAML file in some way, or you can just have a database backend for your uh, translation keys. Um, or you can do something like Locale App, which is a web-based um, web interface where people can edit the keys, and that can sort of serve as your external source of truth, so you don't have to trust those YAML files that are in your repo. You can just pull from that source and trust that everything's fine. Uh, the concerns that you'll have in mind, again, are ease of use based on who is doing your translations. Um, you also probably want some sort of audit trail if someone accidentally deletes your English.yaml file. Um, you want to have some rollback, like catastrophe um, scenario, so that's whether that's doing a daily database backup, whether that's keeping things in version control in some way, shape, or form, um, those are things that you should have on your radar. So another thing that I sort of want to touch on is why do you want to translate your app? Which is not to say that I think it's a bad idea. Um, I think it's great to support speakers of other languages to make our technology accessible in other places um, to non-English speakers. But when you are deciding to internationalize for 
a given region for a given language. There are things that you want to think about before making that choice, before deciding who you want to translate your app for. Um, an example is other countries have different norms around privacy. Um, in general, I would say in the US, um, we're probably more fast and loose with some of our private information than in, say, Europe. Um, there are things that may be considered more taboo to share, um, such as religion. Um, people are maybe more likely to be sensitive about tracking, about location or like physical location information of theirs being shared. So if your app uh, uses those things, you should think about how that's going to be perceived in the language group in the country and the culture that you're adapting it for. There may also be legal issues if you're actually intending for another country market. Um, there are things like do not track in Europe there are issues around, say, copyright, copyrighted information and the trouble that you can get into for sharing copyrighted information um, or copyrighted content in other countries. Um, there are issues of defamation. Um, the US actually, I believe, has one of the more lenient uh, stances toward defamatory content. Um, so if there's a chance that defamatory content can be included or disseminated through your app, be aware of the potential legal repercussions that you can face in any country that you're, you're expanding to. And another issue is that the same needs may not exist in that, in that place. Um, so if your app centers around something related to, say, the US healthcare market, that's probably not a thing that's gonna translate in other countries. Um, so maybe that leads you to the decision to translate your app for US-based Spanish speakers, but not for uh, Mexico-based Spanish speakers, for example. So my hope is that from this talk, you take, take away the following things. Um, one of them is to think about localization now rather than later. Um, and hopefully there are, there are things that you can win even if you don't actually decide to do any translating. You, when you're translating something, be aware of the quality of translation that you need. And if you want a quality translation, your translators should have a good understanding of your app of how it works, of who it's intended for, of what it's intended to do. Also, translation is hard. Um, it's a hard problem that I don't think there are lots of easy solutions to. Um, and it's something that you, if you care about having a quality product for non-English speakers, that you should invest your time um, in thinking about. And also to know your audience um, when you're deciding who you want to translate for. And with that, um, I'll, I'm going to be hanging out if anyone has questions. Um, and then there's this slide, which is just all of my information. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch, tweet at me, look at my GitHub, uh, look at my website. I got Valerie.codes, which I think is awesome. Um, and thank you so much for coming.